Meet Jack. It's Jack's third month in his new job. He can't believe he's made it this far. You see, for Jack, this is a big deal. Jack works in cyber security. His job is to analyze technical data, monitor threats, and identify detail that could lead to security breach. His work keeps people like us safe from threats we didn't even know existed. Jack has exceptional mathematical and problem-solving skills. And that makes him one of the best. But Jack struggles to fit in. At work, Jack can't sit still in meetings. He can't make eye contact when communicating. And he finds it difficult to make small talk. His colleagues sometimes find him rude, disruptive, or unsociable. And because of this, Jack struggles to be one of them and ends up quitting. Jack is autistic. He is neurodivergent. Simply put, Jack thinks differently. One in seven of us in the UK are considered neurodivergent. So many of you may relate to Jack in some way. But even if you don't, you probably know somebody it relates to. Neurodiversity refers to the different ways in which our brain functions, learns, and processes information. It considers conditions that you're probably aware of, like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia. The problem is, some of the behaviors these conditions result in are sometimes deemed different or socially unacceptable. Sometimes these conditions are also seen as disorders or disabilities. But for Jack, his lack of eye contact is not a disability. It's his way of concentrating on what he's saying. For Jack, his inability to sit still and needing to fidget constantly, it's not a disability. It's his coping mechanism around large groups of people. So even the neurodivergent here today, you have probably recognized some of these differences in yourself. But what you and many others like you have probably not realized is the power of neurodiversity, the talent that neurodiverse people have amongst them. Unfortunately, despite this power, despite this talent, 78% of autistic people are neurodiverse, sorry, are un unemployed. And this is unacceptable, right? But why is this the case? Because neurodiverse individuals simply don't conform to the societal norms that our world is built on. From education to employment, our world is built in a way that excludes neurodiverse individuals and it excludes their different ways of thinking. So my challenge to you today is to think differently about different thinkers. I want to shine a light on this power, this talent, their creativity, diverse perspectives and innovative ideas that are so vital to the ever-evolving and challenging environments like the cybersecurity industry. For somebody who's worked in cybersecurity as a senior leader for 10 years, I know how important this industry is in keeping us, 
our infrastructure and our country secure. But over the years, I've also seen the challenge this industry is facing in doing just that. The increased sophistication, fast-paced evolution, and the diversity of the cyber attacks makes this industry a significant focus and challenge for governments, businesses, and people across the globe. So it's even more important that we have talented individuals like our Jack to help us tackle these threats. But here's another problem. It is claimed that this security challenge is compounded by the lack of suitably skilled and qualified professionals. According to an industry research firm, Cybersecurity Ventures, by 2025, we will have 3.5 million vacancies. That's a huge cybersecurity skills gap, right? But it doesn't have to be that way. Remember our Jack? Remember his exceptional mathematical and problem-solving skills? His ability to think differently? These are exactly the kind of neurodiverse strengths we need in our jobs. You see, Jack, he's amazing at his job. But do you know what makes him exceptional? It's his autism. Because of his autism, Jack has this amazing pattern thinking ability that allows him to differentiate between a malicious and a non-malicious code that perhaps even automated tools may not be able to do. Because of his autism, Jack is so detail-oriented that he is able to spot important information that perhaps his neurotypical colleagues may miss. And it's because of his autism that Jack is able to hyper-focus, which means he can concentrate on one problem for a long period of time, when some of us would have probably given up. So on one hand, you have this increased demand for cybersecurity professionals to fill 3.5 million vacancies. And on the other hand, you have this amazing talent pool of neurodiverse individuals like our Jack or Jills and many others like them who are struggling to hold on to good jobs or are unemployed. So hang on a second. Have we just created an artificial skills gap? If we mobilize this amazing talent into the vacant roles, not only will we be addressing the skills gap, but we will be strengthening cybersecurity. And will be reducing the unemployment rate amongst the neurodiverse community. It's a win-win, right? A no-brainer. Now, of course, organizations across the globe have clocked this, and they have started to recruit neurodiverse individuals into their roles. But just bringing them through the front door is not enough. How do we make sure that people like Jack, once recruited, do not end up quitting after a few months? For this, we need an absolute paradigm shift in developing a sustainable neurodiverse workforce. Now, there's a lot, a lot organizations can do to achieve this, but I don't want to be ushered off the stage, so I'm just going to focus on a few of them. When searching for jobs, what's the first thing we look at? Money. <laughs> Money, that'd be nice. Job descriptions, right? So first and foremost, it's really important that organizations understand that they should get job descriptions just right. You know, Jack, he did not even apply to the first few jobs that came his way. Why? because he simply couldn't do two out of the 10 things that the job description demanded as essential. 
For someone who's autistic, essential could mean it's a must. All boxes must be ticked and there's no negotiation. So organizations need to make sure that job descriptions are relevant, transparent, and as inclusive as possible. So we don't miss out on talent like our Jack. But getting the job description right is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, once Jack had gone through the application process, he was unsuccessful in many interviews. Some of the feedback he got was, he lacked confidence because he didn't make eye contact when answering questions. He didn't come across as friendly and approachable, so he struggled to blend in with the team. He was even told that bringing his fidget toy into the interview was unprofessional and it showed that he wasn't serious enough about his job. All this despite Jack having declared in his application that he was autistic. Remember, lack of eye contact, needing to fidget, are all coping mechanisms and focus tactics for somebody who's autistic. So this feedback doesn't sound fair, does it? Perhaps for someone who's neurodiverse, an initial phone call or a practical workshop to test their actual skills might be better suited. And we need to move away from the traditional interview techniques. But once recruited, what would help retain Jack in his job? a neuro-inclusive culture. A culture where it's not just about improving the company's recruitment statistics, but it's a culture where we're embedding neurodiversity throughout the organization. It is about making sure that the right working environments, education, awareness, support, and training is available to all. This is about making sure that when Jack declines office parties, everybody understands it's because he finds it overwhelming. He's not been unsociable. <clears throat> it's about making sure that when Jack doesn't engage in small talk, everybody knows that he finds it difficult he's not being rude. And it's about making sure that everybody acknowledges the different attributes of our Jacks, our Jills, and many like them. So even after getting job descriptions right and interview techniques right and embedding a neuro-inclusive culture, if we really, really want to have a sustainable neurodiverse workforce, there is one single most important thing that any organization can do, and that is to include the neurodiverse employees in decision making. Ask them what neuroinclusive actions would benefit them. Ask Jack what support does he need to make sure he doesn't end up quitting this job that he's thriving at. So I'm calling upon organizations to take a completely neuroinclusive approach. Now, cyber and tech are just a couple of industries that are leading in embedding a neurodiverse workforce. But these unique skills are beneficial in so many other capacities. So other industries outside cyber and tech should also think about hiring with neurodiversity in mind. If there's anything I'd like you to take away from today, I'd like it to be these three things. One, neurodiversity is not necessarily a disability. Two, we must disrupt the traditional recruitment methods. And three, all industries can create a neurodiverse workforce. Now this talk is not just about Jack. It's about all of you who like him have amazing potential but society doesn't let you shine. It's about any of you that resonates with this. I urge you to embrace your gift 
embrace your power, embrace the talent of neurodiversity that you have within you. Your skills are being called for in all industries. From now on, let's make sure that we change the perception of neurodiversity and we embrace it so that you and our future neurodiverse generation can thrive. You no longer need to fear the traditional perception. You no longer need to mask because the world is waking up to a better understanding of who you truly are. And I hope today I have awakened many mindsets to the gift of neurodiversity. And I hope today we can all embrace thinking differently about different thinkers. Thank you.